Hello and welcome to our 45th lecture in the history of ancient Rome in which we're going to examine the rise of Christianity. The Roman state religion as we examined last time did not have a very powerful ethical element to it. It was not concerned with the moral fiber uh, of its worshippers. For that sort of um, guidance, the Romans, at least the educated classes of Romans, looked to philosophy. And they took their philosophy, for the most part, from the Greek models that were before them. Stoicism, predominantly, was the most popular form of uh, Greek philosophy among the Romans. Um, but there was also Epicureanism, and to a lesser extent, Cynicism. But these schools of philosophy were basically what guided the educated person's ethical and moral behavior. Uh, we're, we're not going to spend time looking at them. That's the subject for another course. Uh, so we haven't got the time to examine them in detail. But we can note, however, that all of those uh, schools of philosophy are, are concerned with one's personal behavior. The purpose of studying philosophy is to find the happiest way of living one's life. And also in dealing with the, your fellow humans around you. So it was philosophy then that basically provided at least the educated classes of the Roman Empire with ethical and moral guidance. Among the ancient religious systems of belief of the Mediterranean, uh, Judaism was the most influential one in having a ethical, uh, a strong ethical element. Although Second Temple Judaism was highly ritualistic in its uh, worship, um, very much like the pagan cults that surrounded it, there always had been, from the start of Judaism, a strong moral element. The God of the Jews, Yahweh, was, was concerned very much with the behavior of the worshippers. And this was written into the ancient book of Judaism uh, from, from way before the period when the Romans encountered them, encountered the uh, Jewish people. Uh, the Romans, uh, in their attitude towards the Jews, had a rather dichotomous view. They regarded the Jewish belief as somewhat silly. Uh, the notion that there could only be one God, for instance, um, was simply, uh, for the Romans, manifestly not the case. I mean, look, look at all the deities. Look at all the uh, uh, different areas of human endeavor and nature that have to be minded. How could one God look after all that? Uh, and also they regarded some aspects of Judaism as uh, bordering on superstition. The prohibition on eating pork, for instance, seemed to them to be nonsensical. But at the same time, the, uh, the chief characteristic or chief advantage that uh, Judaism had going for it in, in Roman eyes was its antiquity. Uh, the Jews could point to the ancient city of Jerusalem, uh, they could point to their ancient temple, and they could point to their ancient documents, their ancient books, which showed the Romans that this religion was worthy of some degree of recognition and respect. And indeed, throughout the Second Temple period, at least the, this, the period when the Romans were in control of Palestine, uh, it was common for the high priest in Jerusalem to sacrifice every day uh, on behalf of the welfare of the empire and uh, then of the emperor, eventually when the imperial period was ushered in. So the Romans then very much regarded Judaism as something of an oddity. Uh, it was occasionally subject to persecution. Uh, Jews could be thrown out of Rome uh, or expelled from the city whenever uh, feelings ran high, because they were exclusive uh, and exclusionary. So they did attract some attention and some suspicion. But by and large, they tended to tolerate Judaism as yet one more of the innumerable religious uh, forms and systems of belief that, that their empire embraced. They could have had no idea whatsoever that uh, out of this relatively uh, small and marginalized religious group would emerge uh, a new belief system that would eventually topple the uh, millennia-old worship of the ancient gods. The historical life of Jesus of Nazareth is uh, given the sources that we have available to us, all but impossible to reconstruct despite the best efforts of modern scholars. The Gospels are not biographies, nor are they historical accounts of the life of Jesus, but they are religious statements of belief uh, written by Christians and for Christians. And, and as a result, uh, they are highly unreliable in their portrayal of events. Other sources from non-Christian non sources about the life of Jesus are also minuscule, and uh, I suppose the most famous uh, non 
Christian statement about the life of Jesus, the so-called um, Testimonium Flavianum, a small passage in the writings of the Jewish uh, writer Josephus, who was writing around uh, the Flavian period in the 70s AD, which makes a statement about Jesus Christ, but it's evidently been tampered with by the monks who were copying down the ancient documents in the Middle Ages, and the, uh, and the interpretation of it is uh, almost a subfield uh, all to itself. The main reason for this, of course, is that the life of Jesus of Nazareth attracted precisely no attention from the educated uh, classes who made up and who have composed our main ancient pagan sources for, for the um, ancient Roman world. Many modern scholars have attempted from uh, all available evidence that they can draw on to reconstruct the life of the historical Jesus, and some of these reconstructions have received considerable attention in the popular media, but in the end, my personal view is that the whole endeavour requires too much speculation and our sources are just not good enough to be able to do so. However, that a Jesus of Nazareth lived uh, sometime in the reign of the Emperor Tiberius, that he preached uh, and um, founded a new religious movement in Palestine, I believe is not to be doubted. I don't agree with the extreme sceptics who think that the whole thing is a myth and that there was no Jesus at all. Nevertheless, the vast majority of the, of the ancient world, certainly the pagan world, paid absolutely no attention to these events. Christianity then was restricted initially to the area of Palestine and its first greatest hurdle to overcome was an internal dispute uh, over procedural and doctrinal matters. The dispute was between Peter and Paul <coughs> excuse me, over whether or not uh, new converts had to first of all become Jews uh, before becoming Christians. Peter believed that uh, the new converts had to be uh, Jews first. Paul believed that they could just go straight from whatever belief they had, paganism, uh, into, into Christianity. Paul's view eventually won out, and that was a decisive moment in the history of early Christianity. If Peter's view had won out, possibly the movement may have petered out by the end of the first century AD. Who, who knows what might have happened? But Paul won out, and he uh, w uh, um, took off across the Mediterranean, proselytizing aggressively, especially in the cities of the Eastern Mediterranean, although he did end up also in Rome, and established uh, a series of Christian communities, especially in the cities of Asia Minor and the Eastern Mediterranean in Greece as well. Uh, others carried on his work, and by the end of the second century, uh, so around AD 200, Christianity was a minority religion by all means, but was well established uh, in various urban centers around the Roman Empire. Its greatest area of concentration was in the uh, eastern half of the empire, but there were also um, cells of Christians to be found in the capital, in Rome, and elsewhere. But still, the actual numbers of Christians in this period would have been minuscule compared to the overall population of the empire. It's very much a minority religion. The Roman officials took little or no notice of Christianity initially. It was yet one more religious belief. There were so many of them uh, in the Roman Empire, and the Roman pagan mind was generally uh, very tolerant, as we've seen, with, with regard to diversity of belief. The inclination of the Romans was to recognize and absorb new cults uh, so as to keep the Pax Deorum, uh, rather than to try and stamp them out. There were some exceptions, of course. Uh, the Romans, for instance, in 186 BC, the Roman Senate issued a decree banning the rites of the Bacchanalia, uh, the worship of Bacchus, who was the uh, Roman equivalent of Dionysus, orgiastic rites uh, that, in, that, that, that were beyond the pale uh, in, Roman, um, in Roman state religious terms for their excessiveness. But they were more concerned, it's quite interesting because we have the text of this decree from 186 BC preserved in an inscription. And the reason that the Senate gives is not so much the excessiveness of the rites, but the fact that the uh, Bacchic cult was organized into cells, uh, small groups of people who met in secret, uh, and whose loyalties seemed to be more directed at each other than at the proper uh, focal points of one's loyalties, which should be one's family and the state. So it was really a sort of a social and political objection that the Senate had, and far less a religious-based objection uh, to the Bacchic rites. Another um, uh, form of cultic ritual that attracted Roman attention and was suppressed was Druidism, but again, for political reasons. Uh, it turned out that the Druids, or at least in, in Roman eyes, Druids popular in Britain and northern Gaul, 
uh, acted as focal points for political and military resistance to Roman uh, expansion in these areas, and so they were, and so they had to be suppressed. But again, for political reasons, not necessarily because of anything that the Druids themselves believed. It really wasn't in the pagan uh, makeup to stamp out a belief because it was a belief. Uh, rather, they looked at the consequences of the belief, especially the social, political, and military consequences, and if they were, and if they were deemed detrimental, then in that case, um, the uh, religion could find itself persecuted. Now, in the course of the first century um, AD, in the 40s and 50s and 60s AD, the Christians had begun to attract some suspicion uh, among certain quarters of Roman society. There were several reasons for this, so I'll just mention three of them. One of them would be, for instance, that Christians refused to take part in the communal celebration uh, and recognition of the state gods. Um, they would not show up at communal sacrifices, they would not take part uh, in religious festivals that were celebrated by the community. And, and as we've seen uh, in Roman pagan mentality, this was a statement by the community as a whole of its devotion and recognition and respect of the deity involved. It was essential to the maintenance of the Pax Deorum. If segments of your community refused to take part in that, then you were risking the Pax Deorum and the consequences for the whole community could be disastrous. So, it must be stressed again, it was the Christian refusal uh, rather than the Romans trying necessarily to force them to, to, to take part in these rituals that attracted attention uh, on the part of uh, the Romans. They found this somewhat worrisome. Secondly, Christians were accustomed to meeting secretly, uh, usually just before dawn or in the evenings, at night time. Secret meetings of people was, were always a matter of some concern for the Roman officials, and, and, and for good reason. For instance, the tribune, the renegade tribune uh, Clodius Pulcher, had organized his gangs of ruffians uh, that dominated the politics of Rome uh, in the early and mid-50s BC, He'd organized those into groups of political clubs called collegia, which uh, he had used as, as a way of marshalling, uh, and, uh, marshalling his forces and deploying them for political purposes in the Republic. As a result, such secret meetings, collegia and other secret meetings of that nature, were viewed with grave suspicion and were largely, in fact, under the emperors, banned altogether. So the fact that Christians were meeting secretly uh, um, at night uh, and in the dark was a cause for some suspicion on the part of the Romans. And we hear as well that there were rumours of cannibalism. Uh, there were rumours of eating of flesh and drinking of blood, uh, and this behaviour as well was considered an offence against the laws of man and the laws of the gods, and risked again incurring divine wrath on the society that tolerated it. So some suspicions had been around already when, in AD 64, the first persecution of the Christians took place. It happened almost by accident uh, in the reign of the Emperor Nero. In that year, there was an enormous fire in the centre of Rome, it's often called the, the, the Great Fire of Rome, and is the occasion when Nero was said to have played the lyre and sung about the fall of Troy uh, as Rome burned. In the wake of the fire, large sections of the centre of the city, especially the area around the Colosseum today, uh, were cleared out of the um, hovels and tenements and so on that had uh, formerly occupied that space and were used by Nero to create what can be described as sort of a theme park in his own honour. Uh, he built an enormous rustic villa, an, an artificial lake, he imported animals in and built uh, follies and hills and an enormous causeway and a giant statue of himself uh, in the guise of the god Helios, the god of the sun. Um, and the people of Rome got suspicious. They became suspicious that Nero had in fact started the fire in order to build his uh, pleasure palace in the heart of the city. To divert attention away from himself, Nero blamed the Christians. And when their doctrines were uh, investigated, of course, there was all kinds of talk of the end of the world and Judgment Day, um, and it seemed to be confirmed. So the first persecution of the Christians happened almost by accident uh, and was restricted really to the area of Rome. This is a feature of Roman persecutions, the pagan persecutions of the Christians as a whole. They tended to be occasional, half-hearted, sporadic, and quite localized. Uh, there was one, one exception that we look at um, shortly. But by and large, the Roman persecutions of Christians were not nearly as uh, disastrous as many people would have us believe. 
Following this uh, treatment by Nero, Christianity was left largely alone for, the, for most uh, of the 2nd century AD. There were occasional pogroms against Christians in Gaul, for instance, under Marcus Aurelius, but by and large they were left alone. The, the attitude of the authorities seems to have been sort of a don't ask, don't tell approach, um, but it does seem that Christianity per se had been prescribed by law, although the law hadn't been fully worked out into how, um, as to how the Christians should be dealt with um, all across the empire. And the most remarkable document we have from outside uh, the Christian community at this time describing and dealing with Christians as written by an outsider is a letter written by Pliny the Younger around AD 111 from northern Turkey, the province of Bithynia and Pontus, where the Emperor Trajan had sent Pliny to look after the affairs of that province. And it's a letter in which uh, Pliny describes, he, he was a pagan gentleman of course, describes as an outsider uh, his uh, encounters with the Christian faith in, in northern Turkey in the, at the beginning of the 2nd century AD. We have Pliny's question as sent over to the Emperor Trajan and Trajan's response, and they're quite interesting documents, fascinating documents in fact. Pliny says that he has uh, never dealt with the issue of Christians before and is writing to the emperor to find out what he should do. He doesn't know if the Christians should be punished uh, and a distinction should be drawn between them depending on their age uh, and social status. And he also doesn't know whether uh, they, uh, the Christians should be punished by virtue of just being Christians or because of, as he puts it, the crimes associated uh, with the name of being a Christian. He says his procedure was to ask anyone accused of being a Christian um, whether they were Christians. If they refused, he let them go. If he said, no, I'm not a Christian, then they were released. If, however, they persisted, Pliny says, uh, he would ask them again a second and a third time and threaten them with, with punishment. He says, if they insisted then I ordered those who persisted to be led away for execution, for I had no doubt that whatever the, the nature of their belief, their stubbornness and inflexible obstinacy surely should be punished. That, that's spoken like a true Roman governor. Regardless of what they said, the fact that they just did not respect my position uh, was worthy of punishment in and of itself. Then he says, once word got out that he was investigating Christianity, anonymous pamphlets and letters began to show up, pointing out various people in various communities around his province. Then he would have been travelling around to various cities, holding what are essentially assize courses, uh, um, courts in these places. And once word got out that Christianity was under investigation, anonymous pamphlets began to turn up. His, his procedure here was to uh, have people brought before him and put them through a test. If they prayed to the gods of the Romans, uh, sacrificed to, to the gods, uh, made an a, a, um, uh, act of supplication to the image of the emperor. Remember, the imperial cult was also a feature of paganism at this time, especially in the eastern provinces, as we mentioned in a previous lecture. Then if, if they did all this and if they cursed Christ, uh, then he would allow them uh, to be released. He said, people, some people said that they were, had been Christian long, long ago in the past, but, but had given the whole thing up. Others uh, said that they were Christian, but said that they hadn't done anything wrong. And then uh, the next section of, of the letter is an outsider's account of early Christian religious practice. And it's fascinating for that reason. I'd love to read it out in detail, but we haven't got the time. He basically, the people point out that they gather, uh, um, um, usually before dawn, they sing hymns to each other and to Christ uh, as if he were a god. They take an oath, which is a cause of concern for the authorities. But the oath is not to commit uh, theft, robbery or adultery, or not to break their word and not to refuse to return a deposit uh, when they were called upon to do so, so not to keep someone's property if they were entrusted with it after they were asked to give it back. These are all honourable acts indeed. They also then, the Christians said that they would then go home and gather again in the evening to dine together, they said, on food that was ordinary and innocent. Uh, they're the actual words that Pliny uses. So the idea of cannibalism, the Christians saying, no, 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 you've misinterpreted that. Pliny says he, he then investigated the matter by torturing two female slaves who were said to be deaconesses uh, in the church. He says that this is really what they were called, deaconesses. So he says, finally, he, he sums up by saying, tell me what to do. And Trajan's response is very interesting. Now, this is the emperor of the Roman world responding what to do about the Christian problem. And here's his response, and I shall read this one out in full. You have followed the procedure which you ought to have, my dear Pliny, in investigating the cases of those who, who have been brought before you as Christians. It is not possible to establish a general law which will provide a fixed standard. 
However, these people are not to be searched out. If they should be brought before you and prove guilty, they must be punished. With this proviso, however, that anyone who denies that he is a Christian and proves this by his action, that is, by worshipping our gods, even if he has been suspected in the past, should obtain a pardon because of his repentance. But pamphlets published anonymously should have no place in a criminal proceeding, for this is a very bad precedent and not in keeping with the spirit of our age. Don't ask, don't tell policy. And Christians have, in the Roman eyes, they have as much uh, a chance of getting out of punishment as they can be offered, and if they refuse, then they almost deserve to be punishment uh, uh, to be punished just because they're being so obstinate. In this uh, um, environment, then, Christianity continued to flourish in the second century, but in the, but in the third century, things got a bit hairy for the Christians again. As we've seen, the, the situation was that the Roman Empire was in great uh, disarray, and emperors increasingly shaky on, the uh, on their thrones appealed to divine legitimation to uh, support their regimes. In this scenario, failure of a Christian community to recognize the, di the divine legitimacy and the divine support of the imperial rule then became an act of political insubordination. And as a result of that, the Emperor Decius in 249 through, through 251 instituted a fairly major persecution, empire-wide persecution of Christians. That was carried on for about 12 years. It wasn't necessarily a, 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 a attempt to crush Christianity. Decius's demand was not that the uh, Christians give up their beliefs, just that they take part in the communal rites, that they do not uh, risk uh, undermining the Pax Deorum. You must imagine the absolute frustration and incomprehension of the authorities. Why won't you do this? It's such a reasonable request. All we want you to do is come in and recognize our beliefs. We, we don't require you to give up yours. And yet the Christians refused. So um, it, it must have been entirely incomprehensible to the authorities why this should be the case. With the reorganization of the Roman Empire, as we'll examine in the next lecture under Diocletian, uh, the position of the emperor as a divinely legitimated and divinely sponsored ruler was increased and systematized in a way that hadn't been the case before. And as a result, uh, with the empire now reorganized and uh, facing uh, threats from outside and also from within, uh, it was imperative that people recognized the divinely sponsored position of the emperor. It was even more imperative than it had been in the third century. And under Diocletian, as a result, Christian refusal to do this was considered as nothing other than pure sedition. So Diocletian introduced the so-called Great Persecution. This was the only real attempt ever embarked upon by the Roman state to fully extirpate the, the Christian faith uh, from, from the empire. It lasted some 12 years from 299 through to 311. But as we'll see when we look at the procedure uh, of this persecution in the next lecture, it was also quite regional and it wasn't enforced in a uniform way all across the vast Roman Empire. All of these pagan persecutions, sporadic, occasional, and largely regional and localized as they were, pale into insignificance uh, to the sort of persecution that Christians uh, introduced against both the pagan cults and against other Christians who did not hold to, to uh, state-sponsored dogma in later years and in the Middle Ages. So the pagan persecutions of the Christians, which have come down to us, of course, in the acts of the Christian martyrs and so on, which are horrific in describing the sorts of events that took place in the Roman arena, uh, shouldn't be... Um, uh, um, exaggerated. Uh, certainly people died and died horribly, but uh, th there was really not ever any serious attempt uh, systematically enacted by the entire Roman government all across the empire to seek out and wipe out the Christian faith. It simply wasn't in the pagan mentality to behave that way. They just, uh, as long as people kept, their, kept the peace, then that's what the Roman authorities were most concerned about. In the course then of the 3rd century AD, Christianity rose enormously uh, and uh, also in the 2nd century AD, it, 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 uh, it arose in popularity. This period, the 2nd the, the, the and 3rd centuries, has been deemed by one scholar the age of anxiety. It's a period in which the population of the Roman Empire is actively seeking out uh, religious comfort for the um, state of human affairs, especially in the third century when the empire was under such pressure and was in fact splitting apart. In this period, magic superstition and oracles of all sorts 
flourished, this comes across to us again and again from inscriptions and the literary evidence. Uh, the educated classes, men like Marcus Aurelius, turned more and more to philosophy to try to understand the nature of the human condition uh, and the place of mankind uh, in the universe. Some clear manifestations of the uh, popularity of, are, are, are the rise of a religious feeling, a religious uh, quest on the part of the population of the empire in the 2nd and 3rd centuries AD uh, can be identified. And chief among these is the appearance of mystery religions, at least the growth in popularity of so-called mystery religions. Mystery religions had been the, uh, always been a feature of uh, ancient uh, pagan practice. But their popularity grew immensely in the 2nd and especially in the 3rd century AD. A mystery religion was basically a special sort of a contract that the initiate into the cult um, entered in upon with the uh, deity involved. It was a special con It was not monotheism. It simply said that the initiate into the cult would give special reverence to this deity above others. Uh, the deities involved in these mystery cults especially the ones that became popular among the Romans in the 2nd and 3rd century AD, are mostly Eastern deities. Isis, for instance, from Egypt, or Mithras from Persia. What happened was the initiate uh, entered into an agreement, went through a series of rituals that were secret. They were hidden, hence the form, mystery. Uh, and once the initiate had, been, had gone through these rituals and had been brought into the cult, that, it, that initiate was then... Uh, under the special protection of the deity involved, Isis or Mithras, for instance. These cults were exclusive and they promised great rewards to all initiates for proper observance and, and the special reverence to the um, deity involved. I stress again, though, they're not uh, um, monotheistic. Uh, mi members of mystery cults will still take part in all the rituals of the state religion. It's just that their chief religious devotion was now directed at one deity above others. They also charged for initiation. Uh, in, in order to get in, you'd have to make certain offerings, uh, carry out certain sacrifices, so there was a price to admittance. So the cults, especially of Isis and Mithras then, the growth in the popularity of these cults is a clear sign of what's been termed the age of anxiety and the desire of the Roman people uh, for some sort of religious um, explanation of the position of mankind in the world. So as a result of this, then Christianity had some competition, not just from the philosophy and the philosophical humanism that we looked at at the beginning of the lecture, but also from a variety of oracles and superstitions and magical uh, um, cults and from uh, the, the, mystery, the mystery religions that were becoming popular uh, in, uh, at this time. But Christianity had several advantages over all of these forms of um, religious and quasi-religious uh, observance. Unlike philosophical humanism, for instance, Christianity did not require a great education to pursue. Uh, one, had to, one didn't have to devote large tracts of one's time trying to understand complex Greek philosophical concepts. And so uh, it could appeal to the uneducated classes. Unlike mystery religions, Christianity did not charge for admittance. There was no entrance fee. One didn't have to uh, um, pay any money or perform any sacrifices to be admitted. Christianity was also open to all comers. This couldn't be brought home any more clearly than the fact that Pliny, in his uh, letter to Trajan, comments that uh, two deaconesses of the Christian church in Asia Minor were slaves uh, of the lowest status grade in the Roman social hierarchy, and yet not just members of the Christian church there, but officials in it. And also, Christianity's doctrines were extremely uh, appealing during the Age of Anxiety, especially the age of uh, tremendous upheaval in the 3rd century. Christianity promised eternal happiness uh, in, in payment for present-day and temporary sufferings. How much better a way would there be to deal with uh, the uh, temporal problems of the 3rd century AD than that? The church was also extremely well organized into cells. It had a pope in Rome, uh, archbishops and bishops with uh, regional control over parts of the empire, and then deacons and priests below that. 
in various cities, so highly, highly organized um, administration that uh, allowed the church to really set down roots in a very firm and, um, uh, firm and powerful manner. Having said all that, by the end of uh, the um, third century, by AD 300, Christians were still uh, very much a minority religion. They were well dug in, well ensconced. Uh, they had suffered some persecutions, but they had emerged. Uh, and uh, they were around, a feature of life in the empire, but they were still not particularly well, uh, um, well, they weren't very powerful or in positions of tremendous power. Remarkably, in the 4th century, there was a complete turnaround of that position, but to understand that process, we have to return to our narrative. 